Hello everyone. So I'm about to interview for a job in quantum computing, so I thought now might be a good time to go over some of the basics of quantum computing so that I can try to remember how it works, and so that those of you who spend your precious time here on Earth listening to me yabber on, thank you, by the way, from the bottom of my heart for giving me your time and attention. And uh, yeah, let's learn a bit about it. So to begin, let's think about the basic unit of computing, right, which is the bit, a zero or a one. And let's think about the simplest problem that there is in addition in arithmetic and in all of mathematics, really, which is, it's not one plus one, it's zero plus one, right? Because what is zero plus one? It's one. So in classical computing, that's what you have. You just have zero and one, and you can do all the mathematical operations that you do on zero and one, right? You can add, subtract, multiply, divide. Mostly you actually just add and subtract and you can build all the others out of those. I might go over how classical computing works sometime. It's actually fairly interesting how you actually get a computer to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, but everybody knows how to do those things on pencil and paper, and the computer is just doing some version of the thing you learn to do in elementary school where you, you know, carry numbers and push them around and do the problem. So, but what, what does a quantum computer do? Well, a quantum computer works on these other things called qubits. So that involves these funky symbols I've written here, which, you know, what the heck are those? Those are what's called kets. Because in quantum mechanics, we have bras and kets. And those are, well, they're together a bracket. Very creative name, huh? And we use those to represent what we call quantum states. And so in a quantum computer, we use something called, excuse me, spin to represent up and down. And the, sorry, we use spin up or spin down, which is just a quantum state that you can have to represent the numbers zero and one. And so in quantum mechanics, zero plus one does not necessarily equal one because we're not just talking about the number zero and the number one, we're talking about the state zero and the state one. And quantum states are not the same as numbers. And so don't worry too much about what these ups and downs are, just trust me that they exist. And they exist as these two distinct things that we can use to represent zeros and ones. So what else can we do? Well, we can do another thing called the tensor product. And so this is another mathematical operation we do in quantum mechanics that is not quite like its classical counterpart, where the tensor product is not like regular multiplication, right? So, you know, up times up, what the heck does that mean, right? Up is not a number. Well, no, it's a quantum state. And when we take the tensor product of quantum states, we're basically just gluing them together. So this little, this little, it's like a little, you know, time symbol with this that's inside of a circle. We call it the tensor product and it's used to sort of glue quantum states together. And what a quantum computer does is it takes what's called a superposition state, which that is this thing, zero plus one, right? The reason that zero plus one is not just one is that it's instead this combined thing that we call a superposition where it might be zero, it might be one. Because you might've heard of this idea of quantum superposition, right? That something can be in two states at the same time in quantum mechanics. And what we do is we take the tensor product of superposition states, right? So you can take tensor product of up, up, are, are up and up, and you just get up, up, right? Because remember I have written here, we have two bits. We have bit A, which can be up or down, and we can have bit B that can be up or down. So, you know, one and zero, up and down. And what happens if we have, you know, up A plus down A, so superposition state, and we take the tensor product with another superposition state, up B and down B. So these are not, these don't just reduce to, you know, up times up or down times down. So we can't just glue everything. Well, we can glue everything together, but instead of getting, you know, one term, 
we get four, right? We get up, up, plus up, down, plus down, up, plus down, down. And that's kind of complicated, but complicated is useful sometimes. And quantum computing is exactly such a situation because I have this whole mess here written at the bottom, right? Where you see now we go back to saying, okay, you got up, up, down, down, up, down, it's down, up. Um, all of those things in your tensor producted superposition state. Well, what that gives rise to is effectively something where you have 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, plus 1, 1. And in a quantum computer, you if you have this state, you effectively have four states at once, right? And so this is where the power of a quantum computer comes from, right? In a classical computer, your bit is either a 0 or it's a 1. And you do your calculation where you add, either you add a 0, in which case, you know, the number you're adding it to stays the same, or you add a 1, and the number you're adding it to increases by 1. In quantum mechanics, you, you know, if you, if you add if you add up to the same quantum state, you get just a superposition state. And if you glue it onto a different quantum state, you get this tense complicated tensor product state. But if you then do some clever things and you feed this more complicated state, this more complicated state, through some quantum algorithm, you can effectively add 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 all at the same time. So that's actually even better, right? Because imagine if you could take a number, add 0 to it, and add 1 to it, and simultaneously get the answer to both questions. Now, if all you're doing is adding 0 and 1, that's not that helpful. You say, okay, well, I already knew the answer to 1 plus 1 is 2, and the answer to 0 plus 1 is 1. But the more complicated it gets, the more bits you start adding, the better it gets, right? Because, you know, the ability to answer two questions at once, what is zero plus some number and what is one plus some number, who cares? But now you ask, okay, what about, what about these, right? Because in binary, zero, zero is zero. Zero, one is one. One, zero is two. One, one is three. So now we can ask, what's the number plus one? What's the number plus two? What's the number plus three? And what's the number plus zero? And remember, always generalize any, if you can, extend and generalize any solution until it breaks, as long as it keeps being useful, right? Because why is binary useful in the first place? And for that matter, why are, you know, number systems useful in the first place? Well, you know, let me answer that question with a question. Why, why do we use numbers, right? Why don't we just write how, why don't we just do everything in tick marks, right? If you want the number five, why don't you just write five tick marks and, you know, be done with it? Well, because numbers are a lot more efficient, right? When you start out with one, it's just one equals one. It's the same in binary and in decimal and in tick marks. Two, you need two tick marks and you need two binary digits, but you only need one decimal digit. So decimal is winning. And by the time you get, to, so, you know, so you keep going, you know, you need every time you want to do more tick marks, you need another tick mark. But every time you want to go up in binary, not necessarily, right? And again, decimal is definitely winning over both of them, but computers only understand binary and fundamentally binary and decimal numbers are the same, right? By the time I get to the number 22, it's still a little clunky in binary. It's, uh, what is that? One, one zero one one zero is twenty two. But look how many tick marks that is. And then look at the numbers sixty four and one hundred and twenty eight. Right? You know that's definitely getting kind of long in binary. But look how long it is in tick marks. Right? And so that's really the power of of exponential scaling. Right? And this quantum computing scales in the same way, where just like when we want to make bigger and bigger numbers, it's way more efficient to be able to write them down in terms of these powers of two than it is to have to, or even powers of 10, than it is to have to write out every single one of them. In a quantum computer, it's way more efficient 
to be able to just create these superposition states and you know it represent just like just like you know these tick marks are it's not a coincidence that i'm putting these tick marks in groups of five and there's not a coincidence we do that right and so you know just the the digits in a number binary or decimal represent how big a size of number you're representing right you know the tens place, the hundreds place, the thousands place, or in binary, the twos place, the fours place, the eights place, the sixteens place. And it's similar exponential scaling in a quantum computer. And I've, to be honest, head scratcher moment, left some things out, which is that, you know, I'm telling you how fancy this is. Imagine if you could simultaneously add 0, 1, 2, and 3. And in fact, imagine if you could simultaneously add every number between 0 and 128, or every number between 0 and 1,000, or 0 and a million, or 0 and a billion, to some other number, and get all of the answers at the same time. Well, a quantum computer can do all of that, but then it can actually only give you one result at a time, which is, you know, kind of a disappointment. But people are very clever, and they have come up with ways to make use of that exponential scaling. To be honest, there's only two things that we're actually confident a quantum computer can do. One is to implement the famous Shor's algorithm, which is the thing that will let a quantum computer factor prime numbers and break all cryptography that we currently use and require quantum computers for any sort of security, right? Because once you can use a quantum computer to factor prime numbers, current computer security just does not work, and the only thing that will be secure is quantum computers that themselves can factor even bigger, well, it's not factory, you know, quantum computers can be secure against other quantum computers, but classical computers will be unsecure against quantum computers. So that's one thing quantum computers can do, is they can defeat all security and cryptography on classical computers. And the other thing they can definitely do is they can simulate quantum systems. So like, you know, if we sometimes we want to understand superposition states because we're modeling things that have superposition states, like the electrons inside of some really complicated molecule. And they can definitely do that as well. And to be honest, it would be worth the billions and billions of dollars just for those two use cases. But those are the only two that we're sure they can actually provide this beautiful, beautiful exponential increase for, but, uh, yeah, that's the power of exponents. Thanks for watching. Bye.